We live in a world now where the Japanese animated movie business is dominated by the likes of Studio Ghibli and Makoto Shinkai. It's easy for many to lose sight or memory of movies not by those names, especially when they came out in a different time. When I was first introduced to Perfect Blue, I remember it being described to me in terms of Momoido Clover, specifically in relation to Hayami Akari's graduation. The hypothesis at the time was that Akari's decision to leave the group wasn't necessarily her own, but was thrust upon her by managers and producers. This, of course, nowadays can be written off, and some might liken it to a conspiracy theory, but this sort of thing isn't necessarily unfounded in the world of idols, especially when an idol was getting to the point of being considered too old for the image. Mima is a member of an up-and-coming idol trio called Chamu, but it's at the beginning of our story when we see that this is actually the end of her career as an idol, as her manager seems to believe that the idol image is too restrictive, not popular enough, and therefore not profitable enough for her agency. He wants to expand her success and pushes for her to drop the idol label and become an actress. There is conflict between her manager and Rumi, the latter of whom seems to want to keep Mima a member of Chamu because of how dangerous and potentially exploitative the entertainment world can be for former idols. With the career change comes conflict from a number of different sources, gossiping fans, arguing management staff, crazed fans, risque jobs, existential crises with regard to happiness and where to take one's life, dealing with those who wish to live by proxy through you, murder, etc. Perfect Blue is a lot to unpack. Idol fan gossip and speculation is almost essential to keep idols on the minds of fans and the public at large, specifically potential fans. Idol agencies will typically give something of a drip feed of clickbait-style information about idols through various means, including magazines, newsletters, radio shows, TV, pretty much every media outlet at an agency's disposal, and even through the idols themselves. Of course, this would be included as an aspect of a movie about idols, but as demonstrated by the movie, fans aren't always the kindest, especially when their expectations aren't met. Granted, most of the time that criticism goes toward managers, producers, directors, etc., but since an idol's career, especially post-idol, is very dependent on the support of those remaining fans, enough disappointment for those fans can lead to lagging support, which ultimately damages the idol's career. It's part of the reason why it's important to break out of the niche idol fan support and into the mainstream. Unless you are the most recognizable face in a well-known idol group, chances are you will not be very well-known and have to do quite a bit of work to gain that recognition from the mainstream. It's not impossible to do, but some tracks are faster than others. One of the biggest marketing advantages a former idol has over those going straight into entertainment as a general entertainer is the squeaky clean idol image idols are traditionally expected to uphold. Things have changed drastically since the late 90s, of course, but some aspect of those restrictions still apply. Look no further than the Yuki Muda JAVs being put out, for an example. There is a whole subset of the idol industry that fetishizes the idea of an idol becoming impure. If a group, solo idol, or member of a group becomes popular enough as an idol, you are guaranteed to have a JAV parody of them in some form. There is obviously a market for it since the JAV industry can't seem to stop making them. What helps them even better is when a former idol herself becomes a JAV actress. These videos, it seems, can make a lot of money, even as a middling member of a large group. 
So when Mima is asked to do a rap scene in a movie and pose nude for a magazine, it's clear what the mentality behind the move is. What makes it ethically ambiguous is the fact that we never really seem to know if it's really Mima making those decisions. Crazed fans are a rarer aspect of idol culture. Many might assume that it is more common than it really is, and while it still does happen from time to time, surely, it's nowhere near as prevalent as one might assume. Alas, it happens to Mima, and we are taken on a wild ride with this crazed fan and his stalking tendencies. Except the person who we are led to believe to be the crazed fan with the strange parasocial relationship with Mima is a red herring, and it's actually Rumi, Mima's personal manager. Rumi seeks to push Mima back into the idol scene because Rumi always wished to be an idol but was too unattractive or unappealing to make the cut. She relied on living vicariously through Mima, and once Mima shattered her idol persona, Rumi loses her grip on reality and believes herself to be the real Mima. Rumi kills everyone who helped to ruin Mima's idol persona in the process. Perfect Blue has a lot to say about the Japanese entertainment industry, but it is clear that there is so much more going on that the reality of the movie calls itself into question. After seeing Perfect Blue again after a few years, I'm reminded why this is one of my favorite anime movies ever. There is very little pretentious about it. While the only studios that seem to get much international recognitions are the ones with CGI spectacle, Perfect Blue opts for pure cinematic technique. Perfect Blue is a movie that utilizes montage as its main storytelling engine. This is montage in its classic form and not what 80s Hollywood turned it into. Because of how disjointed the movies can feel, as well as the repetition of phrases alluding to dreams and reality, it's not much of a stretch to compare this directly with a contemporary Eyes Wide Shut. Through the duration of Perfect Blue, Mima is shooting a TV series that seems to converge with her real life, but it is excessively difficult to distinguish between the two. What's real? By the movie's end, I left wondering if Mima was ever an idol, as the ending suggests that that was the plot of the series she was in, and not her real life. Yet, her manager, photographer, and the writer for her drama series are all really dead, and Rumi really did murder them. We keep being led on to believe that the bad guy is someone else when it ended up being the one who seemed to vouch for her the most that was doing all the murdering and threatening the whole time. Was Mima an idol in the past? Or did Rumi buy into the drama as a reality? In a way, we the audience were, so it happening to Rumi is not out of the question. Rumi buys the story and kills the people we are made to believe are the antagonists. So we might ask ourselves, are we mere spectators or are we Rumi? In my opinion, Perfect Blue is as much of a commentary on idol culture and entertainment in Japan as Eyes Wide Shut is about secret societies and cults. Sure, you can go into detail about what is portrayed, but in movies whose realities and perceptions of those realities are so warped, you can't really trust what you see, and therefore, you have to question your perception of the experience rather than take the experience at face value. All of that is to say, however, regardless of the way you choose to interact with it, Perfect Blue is a fantastic movie.